So before we start, of course, um, I told them that in Canada we uh, make uh, initially an acknowledgement. So that's what I will do now in the next in the next minute. But we have out of the five two presenters, Nakari Forfora and Rian Frasier. Right, Nakari is uh, original from uh, Venezuela, also my home country. Venezuela, Venezuela, Venezuela. <laughs> Ryan is the outlier, <laughs> and she's from North Carolina. <laughs> but Ryan, you don't have a North Carolina accent. No, so, hopefully you won't think I do. Yeah. <laughs> but she's very good marathonist and runner, so she has been running all these days in uh, close to uh, Canada place, right? So very good. And at the end, we will have a questions and answers. And I will ask uh, Samuel to be the MC after I leave because we have an interview with a faculty interview, so he will take care uh, of the second part. But to begin, let's do the line acknowledgement. And I want to this for us to think in a meaningful way uh, that uh, here we are in a in a place uh, that is inserted uh, not only in a land but in a culture that preceded us. And this is the traditional and un an ancestral and unseen the territories of the coast Salish people. I explained to them that you see a lot of sea, so. Uh, Everything that is related to the sea, uh, of course, was very important for these communities and that interaction between the land and the sea is very important. So these are the territories of the Muskiam, Squamish, Stolo, and uh, Saliwatu nations, if all uh, people enjoy, uh, joining from uh, remote locations. And those are being recorded because it is being recorded, right? I think. Uh, so this is great. And with with no further ado, I think this is um, the introduction. I'm very excited to to have a conversation. We make this super familiar, super relaxing. So um, I think uh, you are ready. And here we have Nikari Forfora, PhD student in forest biomaterials, Rian Frasier, with training in textile engineering. And they will talk about their work. And now the floor is yours. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, thank you for coming. This is way more people than we were told we're going to be here. Um, this is our campus, uh, it looks very nice and green in this photo. Um, yeah, we have a bell tower here that they light up red whenever we win sporting events and things like that. Um, but this is just one part of the campus. And today we're going to talk about LCA and bioproduct development at SAFI, our consortium that was just introduced. So this is our team. Um, not everyone that's involved. We have so many professors, so many other um, institutes, so many uh, companies, but this is the, the kind of core team, uh, mostly research students here, and then uh, several core professors. This was at our January meeting that uh, Dr. Rojas attended. Um, so here, again, I mentioned lots of scientists. These are just in our uh, department, in our uh, university, but we also work with Georgetown, um, Auburn, UBC, uh, other institutions as well in parallel departments. Um, so these are all really great scientists. Some are even uh, retired professors, but they want to be involved in the consortium. Um, so to start off, it's sort of a motivation. I think we all kind of know why we're doing uh, sustainable type research, but uh, for us, it's kind of driven by these global megatrends. So that could be, you know, new ideas about the circular economy. Uh, you know, we need to change, to become more sustainable in our environments, uh, kind of appreciate where we are and, and the world that we live in. Uh, of course, there's a digitalization uh, movement. So even going away from paper, what else can we make from trees? What other resources can we use? Um, of course, because of this, we have some changes in social behavior that also goes along with sustainability, you know, new generations with uh, new initiatives. Uh, we have, of course, the pandemic, which changed a lot of the digitalization trends, uh, other things such as global dynamics and urbanization and population growth. So for this, we have the Sustainable and Alternative Fibers Initiative. Um, we have a link to our website if you want to see it later at the end of the presentation. But our goal is to combine the creative knowledge and efforts of a unique group, which includes like companies, uh, professors, and students, uh, to develop s sustainable and responsible practices for fiber sourcing and utilization to make a global impact. 
Um, and so these are some of the companies uh, that are involved in SAFI. Um, so we have some, some big uh, paper and tissue companies because that's kind of how we started. And then we also have some packaging and even uh, some textile companies. And this is not just in the US, so we're kind of reaching uh, global, globally as well. Um, so part of SAFI is kind of adding value not only to our own university and to our own community, but outside of that as well. And so uh, we are the most aggressive research program to fast track the utilization of alternative fibers valued at 3.5 million per year. I don't know what this statistic is from, but um, that is from our advisor. Um, we have highly trained graduate students uh, ready to create value in our company. So we're really eager to take what we know, what we learned um, in the labs, in, um, in research, and actually apply this to companies. And then third is a sustainability and analytics database. And we're currently developing the data that will be used by consumers uh, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, so you'll be able to kind of see the supply chain, understand like tr the transparency when you see a product on the shelf. OK, so what are we looking at for our alternative feedstocks? And what do we mean by that? Uh, we have planted crops as well as residues. Uh, some of the ones we're looking at include hemp fiber, which could be bast and herd, depending on the application, bamboo, switchgrass, sorghum, which could be sorghum biomass or the residue, uh, ryegrass, and then for residues, wheat straw, rice straw, rice husk, sugarcane gas, and banana tree. And then also, since we have um, several companies, they may have a particular biomass that's close to them or they have nearby that they want us to evaluate, and those will also be included. Um, and then we're also using, of course, considering traditional biomasses, so how they compare in terms of sustainability, how they compare um, in terms of product performance, because we need to understand are our fibers feasible in the market. Um, so we're looking at eucalyptus, northern softwood, and southern softwood. And in terms of recycled fibers, we're looking at old corrugated container for packaging and recovered printing and writing paper, as well as potentially in the future, we're going to look at recycled textiles. So target products, uh, I kind of mentioned this already, but it started with tissue mainly. Um, but we also, since we're a pulp and paper kind of facility, um, but we've moved from tissue to and paper to some applications in packaging, non-wovens, and textiles is our kind of newest area. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this roadmap, but this is kind of how our research is laid out. Uh, we have, I think, 15-ish students in our research group, and we're all kind of divided up into these different activities. Some people are reaching over two areas or three areas even, but... Um, Yes, the feedstock and supply chain, and then characterization, conversion, fiber and product performance, uh, techno-economic assessment, life cycle analysis, and then consumer perception. And even though these are sort of in an order, there are some parts that reach back um, backwards on the chain. Uh, first, uh, feedstock and supply chain. This is sort of an example of some of the research that one of our students has done. Uh, this particular, I think this is looking at mills um, in the U.S. We're focused on North America and the U.S., but of course, again, with certain global clients, they want us to look at supply chain in their particular area. So um, we not only look at where the biomass is available, but where the mills are. So if this is for a tissue application, we look at how close are the mills and what is the availability near this mill to determine transportation costs, which then goes into you know the life cycle assessment and things like that. Um, second would be characterization. So this is actually looking at um, the biomass, the pulp, um, whatever stage of the raw material we're looking at. So here, for example, we're showing um, the chemical compositions. Uh, it doesn't have the, the actual biomasses here because we can't show that, but um, we can show you that the chemical characterization can change based on the nature of the feedstock, which I think most people here know, but it, it's interesting um, in terms of products when we make them, we can say, oh, okay, these two are very similar. Maybe we can use the same pulping process for those. Um, next is conversion. Um, here are two of our lab mates here uh, working on, I think, SCW pulping. Um, for this, you know, we take the non-wood feedstock. Um, maybe it's a normal conventional pulping process, such as craft, or maybe it's something a little bit more tuned to a non-wood, such as uh, fractionation process. 
uh, then we kind of focus on what are our primary products for this and what's been done, what methods uh, seem most feasible. Maybe we have some byproducts, maybe we use this for fertilizer. Um, and for example, here it's sort of a, a circular economy model for this particular example of wheat straw. Um, additionally, I kind of mentioned this, but depending on the target application, we have different types of pulping. Of course, for benchmark, we look at traditional methods. But for, for example, dissolving pulp, we may look at some kind of alternative methods that are not super common in the paper industry. Um, and then fiber and product performance, uh, Nikuri is testing this paper here. <laughs> um, we have a, an app that Ronald Ortega uh, started to develop. And this is kind of to understand, uh, TS7 is a softness measurement, if you don't know what that is. Um, freeness, it's a, it's a paper, um, kind of filtration measurement uh, related to the fines content. Uh, tinsel index, obviously, a uh, tinsel measurement, blah, blah. Um, you can see here that you can kind of change the benchmark that you have uh, and see the, the, these different non-wood feedstocks at different uh, pulping conditions and how they perform. These are actually the, we tested the, the sample product. So for this case, we are looking at tissue. So we had several different non-woods, we tested them um, at different pulping processes and conditions, and then using this app, you can easily compare uh, depending on what application or benchmark you're looking for. And we could, we could show this in more detail, but we're just giving an overview. Um, and then techno-economic analysis. Um, I think a lot of people, well, maybe not a lot, but a lot of people are kind of aware of the general method for this. Um, so for us, we kind of identify the target product and then what sort of technology is used to make that product conventionally. Um, the technology is modeled and a mass and energy balance is done. Then uh, they kind of apply the equipment in a particular, for example, a mill uh, for paper uh, and then determine the capital investment, manufacturing costs, and a full uh, financial analysis for each of the configurations. And then uh, in terms of anything novel we're doing or, or a different type of process that's unconventional, then they sort of make uh, revised models based on this, but kind of keeping the main parts constant. Uh, and then finally, a consumer percept, oh, it's actually not the last one. But okay, this is not the last, um, segment, but we're going to talk about LCA separately, and I agree going to talk about this, but uh, we have consumer perception as sort of the, the overarching, it's, it's a lot of what drives this whole uh, project is what is sustainable, what does it mean? Um, what we find is interesting, this uh, SAT uh, statistic here, that there are a lot of information about sustainability or what it could be or what it might be, but uh, Forty-four percent of people are not clear on how products are sustainable, and I think that's even understandable from a lot of us that understand sustainability to a pretty high degree. But I still don't know when I go to the store what really is sustainable. Um, for example, a lot of companies uh, these are in the U.S., but I'm sure it's similar in other areas too. Uh, if it has paper packaging, they say this is sustainable. If it doesn't have a core, they say this is sustainable. If it uh, has green coloring on the packaging, this is sustainable, and maybe it says it's chlorine-free bleaching and it's sustainably soft. Um, so it's sort of, we're trying to understand what people know, what people want to know more about, and maybe how we can be more transparent in the products that are made. Um, and then in terms of what are developments for bio products, um, this is a product that uh, I'm doing with Mariana. Uh, we're doing some fibrillated cellulose spinning uh, with our very rudimentary equipment here. <laughs> um, but we've spun uh, filaments from our benchmark, which is a softwood prehydrolysis craft, as well as wheat straw. Um, and so you can kind of see there uh, our process. Um, and then in terms of other things we're looking at, we have conventional conversion methods as well as atypical conversion routes. Um, conventionally, I don't know how many people are doing filament or familiar with textiles and fiber spinning, but uh, typically there are two major methods that people use. And first would be derivatizing. 
Um, and so you could maybe uh, make a cellulose acetate, or you can make viscose, which would be the most uh, common. If you've ever seen rayon or viscose in clothing, that would be uh, a derivatization method. Um, and then the other is direct dissolution, which it tends to be a little bit more environmentally friendly, and it, there are newer technologies. And that would be uh, taking the cellulose or the whole lignocellulose biomass, dissolving it in something like ionic liquid or NMMO um, and things like that. Uh, so we're currently looking at a version of the viscose method which is slightly more environmentally friendly, called Carbamate. You use urea instead of um, carbon disulfide. Uh, we're also looking at making acetate films with hopes that in the future maybe we can also spin acetate fibers. Um, then we're looking at ionic liquid, direct dissolution. And then for our sort of atypical or maybe more uh, creative methods, uh, was the act the nanocellulose that we just showed in the previous video, which we learned um, some information from Dr. Rojas and his team at Alto University. Um, so what we've done in this space so far, uh, some of these are not necessarily beautiful fibers, but we're very proud of them. Um, <laughs> and so we have on the left our dissolution by ionic liquid. Um, of course, with each of these experiments, we do a, a benchmark sample. Um, it's dissolving pulp and it's commercially available. And then we have, uh, so far we've looked at using wheat straw as our non-wood, but in the future we hope to use additional feedstocks that we mentioned um, that are going on through the consortium. Um, so here we have the dissolution and then you have our fibrillation and suspension method. And we are in the process of characterizing and understanding how we can optimize uh, the functional properties so that we can use it in a textile um, garment. And then move on to the second to last category that's now at the end. <laughs> so, hello, my name is Naikari and I'm studying my second PhD year. I'm working in the LCA uh, team, life cycle assessment. In, inside SAFI, we, are, we have four students working in this area. Um, we have touched other areas also. Um, Basically, I know that many of you are interested in incorporating this kind of analysis in, in your research. I know Jimmy is there, <laughs> talked yesterday about that. Um, I think that when we started with this project, we didn't know pretty much anything about life cycle assessment, but with the time we have learned, and this is becoming like more important and more complex with time. So what is our main uh, objective in our, in, inside SAFI and specifically inside our uh, tiny tiny team. First, we want to evaluate what is the feedstock production environmental burden. So as Ryan showed, we are evaluating 14 different uh, uh, biomasses. So each one of them have a different fertilization rate, a different practice, how they are bailed, how they are transported. So in this first stage, we wanted to evaluate all of them to have the benchmark from a cradle to farm gate a scenario and then uh, um, specifically this year we are moving to the fiber production when we say that is that we take the biomass that we obtain in the first part and we are then converting to pulp basically because the pulp can be used for different products as ryan said tissue packaging or even uh, for textile production so inside our group or inside uh, lca team we are taking all the different uh, possibilities <laughs> So we have 14 different methods, uh, sorry, 14 different biomasses, and we have five different pulping methods. So this is the combination of all of them will give like a, that much matrix of all the different possible combinations that will give different carbon footprints. So this is what we are doing now in this stage. So what is life cycle assessment? So we are taking the methodology that is the most common use, the ISO 1440 framework, then we move to the product life cycle, which is the actually the hardest part, because you have to collate the data for all the different stages of the product life. Resources, conversion, how is the distribution, the use stage, and the end of life. And basically, if you recycle that product, that becomes a huge monster, because how do you assess that? Then we move to translate all that information in the product life cycle to the environmental categories. So we can say, what is the carbon footprint? What is the acidification or the eutrophication potential of those products? 
So what we think that is hard to assess the sustainability, because we know that many people say that product is sustainable, but they don't give like a number. Something that is like, uh, like something hard that you know it's X amount of kilograms of carbon dioxide. People just say it's sustainable. So this is first we think because we have a huge variability in the data. For example, when you are going to uh, the literature review and you try to collect the data for the different biomasses, people have different uh, fertilization rate, different practices. So they make the cultivation in different ways. So that makes it difficult to collect the data. Then you have different environmental categories or different methodologies. For example, if you use Tracy, that is for the United States, or you use recipe that is for Europe. Then we have a wide variety of methods to allocate the burden. So for example, if you have a system when you, when you produce more than one product, how do you allocate the burdens? So how do you say we, we are going to give 50% to one or 50% to the other? So I also define some allocation or system expansion methodologies, but always is a should, nor a must. So for example, when you try to allocate environmental burdens for recycled fibers, in the literature, we have 14 different methods. Some are defined by the ISO, others are not defined by the ISO. So when you try to uh, allocate those environmental burdens, which one you should use? Never, I mean, no one knows. So this is why Ivana, that is part of our group, uh, she is working in analyzing all the different uh, methodologies and trying to say which one we should use. And actually we are working in, in collaboration with Dr. Kinshi too from Forestry. So we are trying in our group to evaluate uh, all the different established allocation methods to take a, a step back and say which one we should use, adapting and develop a robust methodology that can be used for all our companies, not only for those that produce tissue, for example, but for all of them that maybe are exploring to produce pellets because when you have the life cycle inventory, they can use it. And creating a multipurpose life cycle inventory that uh, all our members can use. So this is more or less the framework to have an LCA. You have to collect the data for, in the case of uh, our interest, that is the pole production, all the different inputs for the biomass cultivation, for the harvesting, baling, conversion, and then you are going to obtain your product. This is what is commonly done in all the attribution and LCAs. But then in our in SAFI, we think that we should include another part, like for example, what is the potential carbon sequestration for the different biomasses? And if we need to include the land use change, because this is a huge uh, variable, like if you change from a forest to a new plantation, you are like depleting the carbon stock, so you need to include that in your analysis. And then when you obtain, for example, the southern pole and the engineer fibers that Ryan is making, uh, we, are going to, we are going to be able to substitute some uh, fossil-based uh, fibers by renewable-based fibers. So in that way, we can evaluate what is the carbon footprint of them and what is the carbon displacement by using those new fibers. So this is what we call our complete methodology. So this is more or less the methodology that we are using to evaluate what is the potential soil organic carbon sequestration. So we are taking into account what are the soil carbon inputs from the below ground biomass. And if, for example, you have a attributional LCA in which you consider all the different steps in the, in the production of the biomass, like irrigation, seeds, electricity, you will have all the emissions in kilograms of carbon dioxide per bond right ton. And that is an attribution on LCA. And then if you include what is the potential soil organic carbon sequestration, that completely changes the way that we can see the carbon footprint. Because if you actually can plant one of those uh, uh, biomasses like a perennial grass in a degraded land, you can actually promote carbon sequestration in soil. So that, was, that is something that uh, might be uh, taken into account. So also, in, uh, we have been uh, working with some other companies and we have uh, encountered this problem. Like if we need to challenge the carbon neutrality assumption from many of the standards. Like the IPCC says that if you use biomass, that is carbon neutral. But as also we have been talking with forestry people, we need to consider the time span. So for example, if we use an annual grass, that you cut and grow every year, or if you use a tree that grows every 65 years, should 
you consider that it's biogenic or not because you when you cut it will like take 65 years again to grow so we need to include now this in the in, the, in our analysis uh, but that is something that it's not like published or very very practiced by L, by LCA analysis so we were talking yesterday in forestry and they are also in the same direction so how to take that uh, part into consideration so how we collect the data for the conversion processes, we use different softwares, like for example, Wingen, Aspen, and OpenSCA to the life cycle inventory. So basically, this is the hardest part. You have to go and simulate a complete pulp meal. And in, particularly in pulp meals, everything is very connected. So if you change a variable in the, as an input, that will change completely the mass and energy balance. So we need to uh, evaluate all the different possibilities. So also, uh, Ronald Ortega also is developing a visualization tool in which we are going to uh, give to our members. So for example, we are in the first stage of biomasses. They are going to go and click the biomass they want to evaluate. Also, they can change what is the, for example, fertilization rates, what is the yield, the transportation distance, what are some of the prices of those products? And you are going to obtain your analysis for your specific case. Because as I said, you can have different practices in different states. So with this uh, tool, we expect that with uh, all the information that we are collecting, with the models that we are developing, then we can send that, this to them and they can like run the analysis by themselves for their specific conditions. So this is something that we are uh, working in parallel, and it has been very interesting. So if you want to know more about our group, this is our uh, page. Um, but basically, you only have to write Safi and CSU, <laughs> and we pop up. <laughs> um, thank you on behalf of our team. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Nikari and Ryan. Really appreciate that. Um, I really love the robust approach you guys are taking to life cycle analysis and especially holding companies accountable and giving um, sort of some information back to the consumers for uh, holding them accountable for greenwashing. And you didn't use that term, but that's <laughs> what we were all thinking. Um, and absolutely slapping green packaging on something doesn't make it more environmentally friendly. So I really appreciate that take. Um, we're going to open the floor up to a QA and a now, so if there are any questions for these two, I've uh, got one already, <laughs> Oliver, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I was just uh, wondering about uh, water consumption, the uh, production of the mm -hmm. agricultural products as well. This, this is also something for uh, looking to put more water as well. Yeah, I think that that is interesting because in some of the methodologies, water like doesn't like participate in many you know, of the environmental categories. But many many people is talking more and more about water footprint. So you need to report also what is the water consumption for your product. Yeah. So we need to consider the water consumption in the biomass and also in the conversion process. Mm -hmm. So basically, the alternative fibers that we are using they are not irrigated. I mean, just uh, by rain. But uh, if they use uh, irrigation, like for example, sugar cane is commonly irrigated, and we are also developing the model for cotton, we need to consider the water footprint there. So we are, we are taking. Yeah. Um, it's related to this question as well, but um, there is sometimes like different perspective which is there, which is worse. Uh, for example, um, recycled plastic, but um, if we um, don't recycle plastic and it becomes microplastic, it becomes water pollution, um, which is worse, doing this direction or using tons of water, cleaning up everything, but it's uh, it takes time and the energy to collect everything uh, from everywhere and uh, um, we recycle it, but at the end we use our own energy. So if we have this type of um, conflict, how do you evaluate which is better, which is worse? I think that also we were in the in that talk in the morning, and you need. I think that in that case you need to use a multi-criteria analysis 
to decide which is better because you need to put in consideration, okay, I'm, in this scenario, I'm using more energy, more water. Uh, in this scenario, I'm not using that, but I have another kind of pollutant. So I think that in that case, we need to develop both the scenarios and use that kind of software that like make the, like the whole picture and take the, the best decision. Because sometimes you can take the decision, but it's would better if you use that kind of multi-criteria decision software. I think also to add, it's sort of um, the products that we're trying to make are as, um, I guess, efficient uh, and non, I don't know what exactly word I'm trying to think, sort of linear as, possi as possible so that you kind of start out with the material that no matter what the consumer does with it, it will probably be in a better state than um, dealing with waste from uh, textile, like for, I'm thinking waste textile sort of situation with the microplastics and yes, you can re recycle the polyester, but then it kind of same question or same statement you made. I think that sort of the idea too, is to kind of make new products that don't have so much impact to begin with. And as long as people are willing to buy them, then creates a better circle, I guess. That is something that, for example, consumer perception is in. Um, the uh, analysis or uh, surveys that Keren is doing, she's evaluating like what is the perception of consumers about bleaching, about the color, about greenwashing. So for example, we have found that people, I mean, can be like good buying tissue that it's a natural color, doesn't have to be bleached. So for example, in our direction would we'll be like, go more like without bleaching tissue, without bleaching the packaging, in that way would we'll be like more sustainable from the beginning. What is usually done with wheat straw? Uh, in the United States, it's not allowed to be burned, but uh, India, China, uh, many of uh, other developing countries tend to burn them. So for example, they produce so much wheat straw that, okay, they use some for animal bedding, some for other purposes, but mostly when they don't know what to do with, with it, just burn it. In the United States, actually, they like bathe that and put it like in the road, and they don't know what to do. <laughs> but right now, I think there is a meal made in Germany that they are producing tissue from with syrup. Uh, yes, that's what they are doing. Only one more. Talk to me after. I'll tell you a story about wheat straw and straw. <laughs> Another question is, is your group considering hemp fiber? Yes. <laughs> yes, we are actually, uh, we as first started with her because uh, we have some companies in North Carolina that are using the bath for textile applications. Uh, but as the price have increased um, by crazy in the United States, uh, we are trying now to use the whole, the whole uh, plant. And they are growing fiber, like, tall uh, uh, stocks because in, in North Carolina you have to have like a permission to grow hemp. Right? Yes, uh, with the years, in the case of, you know, in the U.S. hemp was banned for some years and then they actually for growing hemp there they require like a special permission. But now the growing of hemp has been like increasing, especially for the production of uh, oil seeds and fibers. In the case of North Carolina, the most of the hemp of the variety that is produced is for production for, for the production of fibers. So what is the problem when you want to produce hemp for fiber? You want to obtain longer pass, longer fibers because are used for useful for textile. But if you want this the this hole is like smaller and the core that you're getting is like less, right? So it's not economically feasible for us in the case that if we are trying to use um to, to use Part and also from the from the perspective of supply chain, so that's why we move to using um, the complete stock, like trying to produce it, but it's a complete stock for packaging or tissue applications. I'd like to add as well that that issue is not localized to the U.S. That the uh, prohibition of cannabis around the world has been an enormous stumbling block for the development of hemp in a global capacity, even in some countries like the UK and China, they still require like testing of every production, every batch needs to be tested to prove there's no THC in it. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a really big problem. It's a 
big expense on a very s small margin product. So, but, uh, but hemp for fiber is not the same plant as no. completely yeah. different. It's not, it's not completely not. different. Technically, the same and species. It's the U.S. But, Republicans yeah. and the lobbying and the religious lobby that tend to. Well, it's, it's a really it's complicated issue. Actually, but... No, I know it's a it's a very complicated issue, and there's still lots of different <laughs> places in the world where they're still having regulatory issues. Not that it's banned, because it was fully banned in the U.S. for a long time, but there's still lots of regulatory hangups all around the world. And uh, it is cannabis sativa, so it's the same species, but an extremely different strain than anything it's, psychoactive. It's a different plant. It's, it's, yes, it's it a U.S. sativa. It's yeah. different from season. Yes, absolutely. Do you know that George Washington was a hand farmer? I have heard that. Yes. <laughs> Maybe he was not a public. So. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, we work with uh, another consortium that is focused on hemp on CSU, and they are like growing and uh, testing different varieties of hemp that can grow uh, on the just in CSA. In CSA. So we can see like which one are more suitable for fibers. We can yeah, and there's definitely interesting opportunities coming up in terms of utilizing fibers from um, psychoactive cannabis production. As it becomes more and more legalized, that's uh, a big residual in that industry still. So, um, I have a question for you guys, if I can hijack this for a moment. <laughs> Um, which is to say, in these uh, mechanical benchmarking and this, these testings that you're doing between products, or I should say between fiber sources, are you basing that on a product basis or on a production method basis? It's a product ba basis? Yeah. You mean the mechanical testing, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, like, how, how related are these products that you're testing? Are they uh, produced the same way, or is it more that they're just filling the same uh, place in I the market? Right? Uh, so I think generally we have a benchmark. So for bath tissue, it could be something on the shelf, um, which would be a BEK blend. And so we have, we make our own um, benchmark of this and we test it. And the reason I'm saying we make our own benchmark is because um, we make hand sheets, which aren't an actual product on the shelf, but it's a replication um, of a product on the shelf. And then we try to match or better the properties of that so that it could be competitive if put on the shelf. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. But in the case of, for, for example, textiles, it's sort of, um, there are certain levels. So, you know, you could reach the highest level would be polyester. And it's very hard to match polyester. But maybe you can replace some of the cotton with a man-made cellulose. And so we may have different targets and we, we test those and have our benchmarks, which could be a range or it could be pretty much just one. Um, and then apply the where it could fit in the market from there. And even we can use the same pumping method, the same material, but when you change the like the I don't know the conditions of the pulping, you try to Manipulate. make your pulp suitable for this product or for this product. Yes, for example, we we um, in tissue is the reason there's so much about tissue is because that's kind of the first area. So we tested, I mean, maybe eight uh, of the biomass sources mm -hmm. for tissue. So we did hemp, switchgrass, uh, bamboo, wheat straw, etc. And we did them all by the same pulping processes and conditions, but also altered them all. So we saw a whole matrix of if we test hemp and wheat and switchgrass by uh, this mechanical pulping at this percentage of um, charge, these are the properties, and then we would tune it depending on. And it may come out that hemp is amazing with this process and horrible at this one. Mm -hmm. So even from that too, we could say, oh, um, maybe the mechanical strength, the tinsel strength is amazing, but the softness is really bad. So we would say, maybe this is better for packaging. And so we would kind of... Interesting. So kind of both. Then, yes. Right? Is in, in similarity of product and similarity of method for both. That's interesting. I that's something. Yeah. Right? That's why we created also the uh, the, 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 the tools for the for the fibers because at some point we created this, this big matrix. We were like <laughs> from, we from had like, Monday to Sunday in the lab doing yeah. the testing yeah. and testing and testing. And at some point it was like almost impossible, like moving in like an Excel sheet. That's what we asked Ronald to like try to to do this and wait and do these comparisons on this 
easier to the to our companies like to select the targeted properties and they can check if this if these properties sell, mm -hmm. are match with their necess with their needs they can select the specific value mm -hmm. or for the specific role or change a role because sometimes for example the cast in the case I think specific sorry, you can see that the properties are not really good for issue even if you apply different mm -hmm. uh, methodologies but it's really good to try to do another product like for example a uh, cargo right so that's something and is this like application up and running now? Can we go and look at it, or is it still in development? No, it's just still in development. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll let us know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions, yeah. guys? I'm yeah, right up here. Yeah. So you mentioned about taking economic analysis. So I have a question regarding the software that one. So are you going to uh, include that specific metric in the software as well? And what is the metric? I actually don't know the I, I think to. that uh, basically they are basing their analysis in calculating the CAPEX, CAPEX mm -hmm. and also the minimum selling price mm -hmm. because they want to make the, the product like, um, like to be uh, fire against the traditional pulps. Mm -hmm. For example, if you produce a ton of pulp from our, one of our methods, what is the minimum selling price? And what is the minimum selling price for MBSK, for example? So this is what they are more or less targeting, ca CapEx and, and, the, and the minimum selling price. And they are also evaluating all the different, the same metrics that we have for LCA, they have to evaluate it for techno-economics. So far, we don't know if we are going to include that in the, in the visualization too, because that would be like, a, Big thing. More complex, yeah. yeah but but we, we, we need to, to still see. But for sure, the analysis will be done. I think I saw Yido, but it's like two questions. Uh, so one is just particularly in the fashion industry. I'm wondering if there, I've, I've heard a lot of kind of predictions of trends about which fiber sources will be mainstream. Mm -hmm. Are you guys comfortable sharing kind of the most general trends? I know you guys have. You mean based on the, the fashion industry, what non woods would be yeah, most? Uh, I don't actually know the answer to your question because I think that it really depends on region, um, and it it's like someone who's an influencer could decide that they want to wear sorghum, and it may have horrible properties, and everyone would be flocking to get this outfit you know what I mean um, so I, I don't know and also I'd say right now I mean I know we showed you some filaments and I have done a lot of research but the textile part is the newest part of the consortium and so I think as far as market and understanding um, I know more about the fiber uh, the fibers that are currently used but for nonwoods at least in the US and a lot of nonwoods are not used for filaments um, it's all in labs and in um, in articles. So I, I don't know, but it would be curious to see uh, the market trends. Because I think that if we could follow the market trends, that would be amazing. But uh, yeah. Sounds like you need a celebrity endorsement. Yeah, we do need. Uh, I, I, I have heard about Spinova. What's the name of the company that they have done with wood? And also they they say that they have made with, with a straw. They don't say how, but they say that. My second question was kind of running your presentation is very comprehensive. One thing I haven't heard as much in the presentation was about policy analysis. You guys also involve yourself in the kind of industrial policy that could help, and if so, do you have any kind of low hanging fruit that you guys think? Like policies in the, no, I mean, I think that we haven't get that far uh, regarding to policies, but that's something that we, we might like investigate in the future. That's a good thought, yeah. It's also very not homogenous, right? Every <laughs> yeah. country handles it. That is, that is true. Yeah, thank you. So when you consider the availability or quality of the feed stocks, do you consider the impact of climate change at all in terms of how it affects the composition and availability? In the case of availability, we have a specific area uh, that is the name is right? So uh, we did the, uh, evaluate different scenarios. 
for the production of the fibers. There are some states, for example, in the UK that they produce more of the straw. So we evaluate uh, how we be like um, the, the accessibility straw in the area, or how will be the production of or creates a different um, well me and how would be like accessibility for, for this uh, different for a, for a specific pixel. That's how we mainly evaluate the supply change and we evaluate how would be the cost of the transport and everything. In the case of the related LCA uh, with the supply chain right now, uh, I think uh, I think that we, we are like more focused in a localized production, you know, yeah. like it depends, right? If we have a meal like in Kansas, they are surrounded by with a straw. So that might be the best scenario for sure, because it, it doesn't make any sense that you like bring bamboo from China to get to Kansas to produce something. So it would be better, I mean, we have always think about localized production to see what is the availability of the residue or the crop and then like uh, like uh, may, uh, like go and make the screening to see what are the tissue or the pulpins that are closer to that availability region and to calculate what is the distance. Because this lower distance will mean lower price and also lower carbon footprint. Sure. That's very important. In the case when you go to, to so if you do the analysis to a crowd to the gate to the middle, of transportation is a really big issue in our environmental emissions and also in the cost because uh, transporting uh, a grass or transporting a residue is not the same as transporting uh, a tree, for example. So that's something that we're taking in consideration that is very important as well. And in sometimes, depending on the region, when we have our biomass, we take a different energy source. Another of the energy sources in the in the US are produced from the same um, resource, right? So that's something that we also take into account when we are doing our analysis in our case and in the case of bicycle access. And in terms of like locally, but like, like can you predict maybe we expect more drought in a let's say drought in a particular region? Could you factor that in somehow in terms of how you expect the heat stock to change or availability to be like yes, we take into account, uh, for example, right now we are like doing an above average because, for example, that's something that we have a huge variability in the uh, agricultural practices in the US. It's like it changed from state to state. And right now we, we have an average, right? But, uh, for example, we can do some, we, we have done something like more specifically depending uh, on the yield, the production, for example, the specific biomass. If the yield is like higher in, for, let's say, I don't know, I think in Montana, or than in comparison with North Carolina, the emissions would be higher in North Carolina, right? So that's something that we have to take into consideration. But for taking that into consideration, we run some Monte Carlo analysis to see how it's going to be the variability and see what are the range of emissions that we are expecting or the all the other regions that we are evaluating. I have a question to your question. Are you <laughs> are you asking, um, for example, as time goes on and the climate changes and the weather patterns and things change, how the crops will change and how that affects? Is yeah, that just like if you consider that at all, like I guess like a time, almost like a time analysis of changes in, for example, the you know the temperature changes by one degree over X period of time. How does that affect the crop? Yeah, and it doesn't have to be so specific. But, but uh, that's what in I, general, let's say it gets hotter in the future in, in certain regions, maybe that affects the, the quality of the heat soccer availability. I mean, I think we, we haven't considered that, that, but for sure I think that that will mostly affect the yield, mm -hmm. the, the production. So that will be like a sensitivity analysis. What will happen if the yield decreases 10% uh, because of climate change, how does that affect our our analysis? And maybe that's something that people kind of have started to track, but it hasn't been a long time of tracking the changes of their crops. I mean, of course, they're tracking their crops, but to actually attribute it to changes in climate or something that could maybe be helpful in the future. Yeah, and there must also be so much other variability in that system, like as the adoption of different materials are taken on, everything's changing, it's tough to really do that kind of analysis because the market changes so much here to year. 
this is a really it, tricky problem you guys are taking on. <laughs> yes, and so it, it can be very complex, even for example, sometimes it, it, in that moment we are not taking like the use of the product or the reskillability of the product. Actually, I'm working like, I would be working focus on the reskillability of the product because that also changed like the emissions of what you are producing. It's not the same product that can be recycled one time or to, to another one that could be recycled like several times. Mm -hmm. That changed the you know, environmental footprint. What happens if it goes to the landfill? How long does it take to degrade it? There are so many considerations and so many things that we still don't know because it's also a relative new area of investigation. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry, Kelly, how are we doing for time? Are we done at, uh, at the half hour? Okay, perfect. Well, then let's take one more question if anybody has one. What a wonderful synchronicity. In that case, I will give you guys these gifts from BPI. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for coming and speaking oh, to us today. I really appreciate wow. that. Um, I'd also like to invite all of our guests uh, and anyone from BPI feeling photogenic today to come up to the front for a <laughs> photograph. Okay, thank you so much. Ra another round of applause, please.